Before I introduce the speakers, I'd just like to talk a little more about logistics. Um, we ask that you put your cell phones on silent mode. Uh, we will be video recording this event, and when we do that, we ask that you come up to this microphone to ask questions. The camera will stay on the speaker, so the camera won't show you, but your voice will be recorded. You don't need to be called on, just come up. I think because we have you know, two speakers here, we may not have a long time for Q&A. And so we ask that you keep your questions relatively short. Um, I guess after 2011, we should talk about earthquakes. So if there were to be an earthquake, um, that can cover, and you should remain in this lounge because this building is safe. Um, and it was inspected after the earthquake and proved to be quite robust. Um, please don't use the front glass door in the case of an earthquake. In the case of a fire, though, we got to get out of here quick, so you would use the front door. Um, of course, we do not anticipate that happening. Um, so our speakers this evening have known each other for a number of years. They've collaborated on a book, and they're, they have a lot of similarities, but they're such different experiences. Yoshihiro Takeshita is a historical preservationist involved with the restoration of traditional Minka. He had started as an antique dealer. He has a, a business called the House of Antiques. And very gradually, he got involved in renovating Minka and has now done, I think he said, 34 Minka altogether and worked on many others as well. I am especially appreciative to Takeshi Sun because this last weekend we had about 20 students who visited his Minka and he was very generous with his time and then agreed to come speak here today. We also have with us Asby Brown. I know Asby through a citizen science organization called SafeCast, which is a radiation monitoring organization. And if you go to their website, their annual reports have actually really been written by Asby. Somehow, within a couple of years, Asby became a genuine authority on nuclear issues and has spoken at the International Atomic Energy Association meetings and at various uh, International Committee of Radiological Protection. So, in addition to that, he's an architect, uh, has a graduate degree from Yale, and has written a book called The Very Small Home, The Genius of Japanese Carpentry. And at the Kanazawa Institute of Technology, he did research on neuroscience. So these are very interesting speakers, and we'll let them go. What we're going to start here with is we're going to show a, a short documentary from the New York Times about Takeshita's Minka, and then Takeshita will speak and then ask them. Thank you. I have uh, worked uh, for the past uh, 52 years or so um, uh, as a, an architect and also a builder uh, uh, of uh, Mika. Um, as you probably know, what the Mika, the word is, it, in our um, long history of Japan, uh, we have uh, uh, we had a samurai society that lasted for 700 years. So they had their own houses. Uh, it's called a buke uh, uh, house, and uh, so Mika means. Uh, 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 non-rulers, houses, folk houses, ordinary people. The samurais were special people, but only 4%. So 96% are ordinary people in Japan for 700 years. So uh, today I'm not going to talk about uh, great temples and shrines or castles or palaces or samurai houses, but I'm going to talk about uh, the, the sort of forgotten architecture, the folk houses, Mika architecture. Um, to start with, this photo I took uh, about 20 years ago, one of my uh, main projects. Uh, interesting thing about this Mika, uh, 
is its family's uh, history goes way back 800 years. It's amazing, amazing. And they haven't moved from this place. <laughs> so I put it up on this uh, the fir as a first photograph. Uh, uh, I had uh, uh, renovated it and it <coughs> moved it a little bit fo forward toward the, toward the south and uh, made it livable with a comfort. <coughs> me, I have to watch my time. So, let me see. Uh, this is another project I did near Mount Fuji. Uh, my philosophy or idea of working as an architect is to combine the tradition with the modern. So keeping a tradition but trying to <coughs> put all kinds of convenient, uh, all kinds of convenient uh, appliances uh, in, in, in the life, in, in the new house, to make the house livable with comfort. So uh, <coughs> uh, this is a living room with a view of Mount Fuji through enormous uh, windows. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, uh, it has a very high ceiling, uh, very comfortable fireplace, uh, and uh, uh, nice offro <laughs> with new wood uh, using uh, lots of hinoki wood. Uh, they can, they can, the client could afford it because the client was uh, the uh, Union Bank of Switzerland. <laughs> Upstairs, attic was uh, made into uh, three comfortable bedrooms. Uh, today, tonight, I'm going to introduce uh, Yanami Soetsu. He is a philosopher uh, uh, the, he, of Japan, uh, lived in, uh, in 20th century, early 20th century. But he's the one who said something that I liked as a student at that time. He said, there are many beautiful things made by geniuses. But also there are many beautiful things made by unknown craftsmen. That's what he said. And uh, I saw this, his house, uh, when I was 18. And uh, when I was, I can't remember, maybe 50 or so, I was invited to come to this house and make it uh, uh, renovate. The renovation uh, work was given to me. so. Uh, here are the people who worked with me to make this beautiful uh, uh, Yanami's uh, home livable again, and it's a museum now at near uh, Shibuya Eki, Shibuya Station. Yeah, so you should go Nihon Minyekan. It's called Nihon Minyekan. Uh, this, uh, ah, sorry. Oh. This, uh, he had a, uh, he had an interesting design here, like a bay window from uh, English, uh, you know, Victorian uh, style architecture. Uh, one day I hope you have a time to visit his home. Uh, this is my workshop uh, <coughs> and old fashioned style I work. And then many trucks go in and out. And I do this kind of uh, temporary assembly work before shipping a house to new location. First we dismantle and, and then reassemble to check if each column and the beam is strong and in good condition uh, to, su to support the, the new house. <coughs> uh, Many of them are very, very heavy, very heavy, made of keaki wood, yeah, which lasts a long time, and hardwood. Uh, here is my little post office, HA. <laughs> it's called House of Antiques. And this is a, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not used to this. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, here, we start late uh, to work. In April, we work because we have two meters deep snow every year almost every year. So we can only work in April after snow melts. Chief Carpenter, Chief Carpenter, oh, no point. Chief Carpenter and the son. 
I personally cannot do anything. I, I <laughs> <laughs> Japanese carpenters are fantastic. Uh, I respect them and I try to treat them very well and often my wife gets jealous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so here is old fashioned way of uh, making a, a tenona mortis. Uh, another working place. It, it's in the Gifu. The, my work, working place is the Gifu, which is, do you, do you know Gifu? It's uh, deep in the mountains, uh, between Tokyo and Kyoto, uh, a little bit north. And uh, uh, he still works for me. And uh, uh, so um, we, what we do is to check the, the, the each uh, piece carefully so that uh, uh, some of them, uh, as I said, uh, not good condition. So uh, like this, you know, after 200 years, 300 years, uh, the condition is not uh, good. So we, uh, I choose them and go back to the mountain like this. See? That's, uh, and they uh, become a fertilizer for the next generation trees, <laughs> young trees. So it's a beautiful uh, cycle, cycle of life. And uh, this is a sacred tree, enormous tree. And uh, Japan, I think, is a, a, a kinobunka, the culture of wood. Is, uh, that's something very original to this country, more than other countries. Because there are many, many good trees in Japan. Uh, this is from in Gifu and all uh, Cypress. They produce beautiful Cypress. Right next to Kiso no Hinoki. Kiso is also famous. And, <coughs> and I ask them to cut according to my uh, wish or taste or design and also give the best condition for carpenters. <laughs> yes. yes, so they feel good. And this is one uh, very interesting examples of my projects. Uh, it, this is a 200 years old Japanese farmhouse, but exterior is somewhat uh, like uh, um, east coast of America, the New England style. I, uh, we, in order to get the architectural permit in the Massachusetts, we had to make it a little, you know, a harmonious with the rest of the uh, village or houses. Therefore, I, we, I designed this way. Yeah. I worked in the Buenos Aires. I worked in uh, Hawaii. Uh, they are still there. Uh, uh, the one in Buenos Aires is now a private museum. So if you have time, or well, friends have time, please tell them to go. A place called uh, San Ishidoro. So, um, this is the, uh, the above, uh, yeah. the post on beam structure without roof, without wall, without the floor. Just the skeleton, the post on beam structure. In Buenos Aires, when I was doing this, uh, someone came up with a bicycle and uh, asked me, are you demolishing or are you building? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, my favorite uh, father and the son, the Italian uh, craftsman, uh, immigrated. Um, I want to talk about uh, Mika's variety. is almost endless and the tremendous um, uh, rich design uh, throughout the nation. Uh, for example, the Shikoku has already one, two, three, four, five diff totally different exterior design. And uh, of course, Kyushu on the left and, uh, and close to, the, uh, to uh, Kyoto. And uh, this is the Gasho, Gasho house that, uh, uh, that we showed, uh, we, I worked for the first time that style. When the, I mentioned in the movie about this, and it goes on and on to, to the north. 
and each region has different style. Why? The climate is different. Climate is so different. Some area it rains a lot, or snow, or windy. So each one has different style. And in those days, when the Minka was completed, the architecture was completed, uh, the the re re regional economy was good, which is agriculture basically, and uh, people led a simple life, but very happy, and uh, <coughs> they were they 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 were able to create a beautiful uh, Mika in Japan. <coughs> I mentioned that uh, Gashozukuri, and those Gashozukuris are built around Hakusan area. And Haksam is not so famous as Fujisan, but just as important as Fujisan, it's one of the three most important um, uh, holy mountains of Japan. And I will show you. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's in between, in the border of uh, Gifu Prefecture and the Fukui Prefecture and the Ishida Prefecture and Toyama Prefecture. So often, they were fighting who owns this uh, mountain top. It was a long uh, disputing subject for, I don't know how uh, it settled, got settled, but it's always thingy. The Gif can, Fukui can, Ishikawa can, Toyama can. And that is the Japan Sea. So as you know, the Western civilization came from the west to the east. So from the continent and the peninsula, as they moved, came to Jap Japanese islands, like maybe that kind of boat, I don't know. Uh, the first tallest mountain from far distance when they were coming from uh, continent was this mountain, Haksan, the White Mountain. Yeah, that's why. And also these four rivers supply the beautiful water for rice paddy. Haksan, White Mountain. So this is uh, photo is taken from uh, Pacific Ocean side, but from Japan Sea coast, it's uh, dramatic. It goes 2,700 uh, two meters tall, very tall, yeah, very beautiful mountain. But the summer looks like this, and uh, this respect of water, this is uh, mentioned by Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu 2,500 years ago. And very important in Japan uh, because uh, for agricultural society. Uh, so we believed uh, gods in the nature in those days, pre-modern Japan. Japan. Uh, waterfall itself was also god. Yeah, it's called, the, this one is named Amida. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, river is also considered god. There are eight million gods in Japan. They say, <laughs> yeah, only eight million. <laughs> yes, so gods everywhere. Uh, I took this photo near my uh, workshop, and you see the rice paddy there. We need water, and one difference between the wheat and rice is that the wheat you don't supply water you wait for rain but rice paddy we get mineral water every year mineral water so right if you eat rice you have more protein than uh, wheat so the japanese were able to survive eating just the rice uh, without eating meat much meat until recently so um <laughs> Uh, that's my uh, chief carpenter there. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this character, the, the Yasumu in Japanese, or read, read in, Eng in English, it's rest. But if you look at this, it's two kanji. One is human being and trees or wood. And put together, we read rest or happiness. So um, agriculture society, um, uh, this kind of a word uh, it's, was mentioned during a samurai period 
So all the Chikoku Sen King respect grain and despise money. Uh, that is Confucius teaching. And during agricultural society, it is very important to have um, a good uh, crop. So uh, tax was paid by uh, rice. Uh, another interesting thing among us uh, in the uh, the samurai period is this disarmament took place in the 16th century. 16th century. So that's one of the reasons why Japan is so safe. Because uh, the leader said, uh, "You stay as a, if you want to stay as a samurai, you can wear swords, weapons. But if you want to become a farmer, give up uh, weapons." That's what happened in the late 16th century. I think that's a marvelous idea was a good idea. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and, and a little bit, we go into the Tokugawa regime, 1600 to 1868. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how they looked like, the farmers. And uh, this uh, life of farmers were depicted on big screens, the folding uh, byoku, like this. 18th century drawings of farmers. Women worked the same as much as uh, men, and so not much discrimination, uh, in my opinion. But in samurai society, men are higher than women, but in the farm, they were equal because they worked together. They had to work together, and the kids had to work too. These are drawings, again, from 18th century. And samurai comes once in a while to uh, check the uh, paper, uh, receiving uh, rice. Rice was very important. Rice, rice was like man money. Uh, here's a, a rice, ne? Uh, over here, they are kept. It's about usually 60 kilograms of rice goes into that kind of thing. Every single mika has altar or kamigana, which is nature worship. It's, it's a nature worship altar. And also, second altar they always had is a Buddhist altar to worship ancestors. Uh, I want you to uh, remember this kind of uh, uh, roof. Please remember this. And this uh, is from Yoshinomari Iseki, 4,500 years ago. People think they, they had a, a, a roof like this. Uh, I, I went here about four, recently, about four years ago. Uh, Uenohara ruin, and it is managed, run by Kagoshima Prefectural Prefecture government. And it's amazing thing is the size, but the age, 9,500 years. So this kind of pit dwelling has a long history, long history, really, 9,500 years. A pit dwelling. And this pit dwelling lasted until almost Kamakura Jidai, the beginning of the samurai society. Ordinary people lived in the pit dwelling for a long time. And, and wealthy people are not, yeah. Uh, the, the rulers are different. Uh, inside, check the scientifically it is correct. The white line shows the volcanic ashes. They erupted 12,000 years ago and 24,000 years ago. So we know exactly how old. The photo I took, 1984, looks like 4,500 years ago. <laughs> so I call this, OK. So I call this uh, 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 Jomon Attic. <laughs> so rulers had different, they, were, they had the fantastic houses. But farmers, ordinary people, uh, religious architecture was reached its peak on the already 8th century. Samurai's architecture, called the Shoin architecture, reached its peak already in the 16th century. But farmers still leading 
very modest, simple life, simple house. Uh, this I'm showing this one is strongly influenced by farmhouse, but enjoyed by rulers, wealthy people, for channel you tea ceremony. Inside looks a bit like a farmhouse. Then another type of luxurious uh, square architecture. Trying to combine farmhouse, uh, tea house with uh, uh, showing, showing architecture. And this is my uh, architecture, our unknown craftsmen, uh, 17th century. Um, just a skeleton, as you can see, all woodwork, 18th century finally completed because the Japan was very peaceful and the farmers were, were, were able to build houses and complete their uh, favorite uh, mitas in 18th century. And 19th century, it developed further more, but um, this is the house that I brought to Buenos Aires. Attic is German attic. <laughs> yeah, fire, um, uh, what shall I say, the uh, open fire hearth makes everything, you know, black with the suits. Hiroma wood and powerful cross beams. So 18th century was a good uh, period and representing the self-sustainable society. It was completed in, in 18th century self-sustainable society and comfortable. These are from 18th century. And all those people from the West saw Japan and they were surprised because they were simple and not rich, but they're very happy, smiling, and enjoying life. Uh, so uh, they mentioned many things in their diary and uh, uh, travelogues. I don't go into details, but uh, many Westerners found the pre-modern pre Japan absolutely fascinating. And I think they, 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 they were happy because they totally believed they are part of nature. And as they die, as they finish uh, their life, they thought they go back to the mountains. And 30 years later, those spirits become gods. This is uh, before Japan, uh, you know, this is before Meiji Restoration, that whole idea. Sort of primitive uh, Shinto religion. Uh, since we have no time, uh, I don't go to the, uh, these are the tools, but uh, maybe when we have more time, I talk about uh, tools. So thank you very much. It's a little hard to follow Takeshi san <laughs> uh, No, I really appreciate uh, uh, his work, and uh, he's been inspirational to me. And uh, like Kyle said, we've known each other for a long time, maybe not quite 30 years, but 25 years or so. And, uh, I've learned a lot from him. And uh, yeah, I edited a lot of his books, and uh, you know that was a big, uh, good experience for me. So um, yeah, I want to sort of fill in, fill in, fill out a bit of what um, Takeshi san was talking about, and you know, uh, before you know this presentation, we just had a little meeting, and there's a lot of overlap, um, you know, between what he was saying and what I'm saying. But um, I'll sort of go through quickly and try to leave as much time for uh, Q&A as possible. Um, you know, about a bit about myself. My I came to Japan because I was interested in Japanese carpentry, and I was lucky. I was able to spend three years in Nara at the Yakushiji Temple. Uh, researching the work of uh, Nishioka Tsunekazu, one of the last great temple carpenters. And that sort of really changed my life in a lot of ways. And uh, I spent a lot of time working in architecture on different aspects, housing, etc. And about, I guess it was about eight years ago, I published this one called Just Enough, which is about the sustainable lifestyle in Japan. And that really allowed me to dive into the you know, uh, rural lifestyle, the agricultural lifestyle and to look again at Minka, and uh, it, it, um, 
I was struck by um, these relationships of material, of energy, of water, etc., uh, and how um, well the uh, the people of the time of the Edo period used resources. This is a Japanese edition which came out about two weeks before the disaster in March 2011, and it was a time uh, after that disaster. A lot of you who are, who are here will remember um, there was this great soul searching. People thought, "Oh, what have we been doing wrong? We've we've forgotten all the important things. You know, we have to change. We have to try to recapture some of these values." Um, and maybe I was a bit too optimistic, it didn't happen yet, but I do think there's sort of a groundswell of change happening. Um, Takeshi-san alluded to the social classes of, like this is particularly the Edo period. The peasants were the bulk of the population, 80%. So when we talk about Minka, we generally talk about farmers who are peasants living uh, in the countryside. And their samurai were many fewer, and the emperor and these people were very, very few people. Uh, merchants and artisans lived in the cities primarily. Um, there were a lot of farmers and a lot of farmhouses, and a lot of them are still standing and actually rotting. And this is really a huge tragedy. Um, and again, the urban population and the rural population, they're fairly different in a lot of ways, but they did have a lot of shared characteristics in, in houses and construction and many aspects. Uh, the beginnings, again, we'll, I'll show you a little bit also. Um, uh, Takshan talked about the Jomon period, uh, these kinds of pit dwellings. They continued through the Yayoi period. Almost everybody uh, until 400 AD or so was still living this way. But as Takeshi-san pointed out, it persisted for centuries after that. Uh, this is kind of a remarkable thing. They're thatch roofed. They have dirt, dirt floors. The, the structure is, you know, uh, poles that are lashed together with rope. Uh, and these are all characteristics that uh, remain in the, the Minka. Here's another interior of a Yayoi period uh, dwelling. So um, to me, that was kind of a remarkable realization that, my God, these people have been living the same way for millennia, in a way, the same kind of environment. Uh, society changes, technology changes. Eventually, things like you know raised uh, floors, you know wooden boards. These things came in uh, and uh, changed a lot of things. But uh, the persistence of the, the general uh, sensibility is, is also remarkable. The Heian period, um, where the capital was Kyoto, uh, the farmhouses are pretty pretty similar to what uh, was continuing to be built and used for the next thousand years. Um, they weren't round anymore. They weren't pit dwellings. But the dirt floor was a very important part. And, they didn't really have much of a wooden floor where they put some rush mats over there. Uh, animals are coming in and out, and there'd be an open fire. Uh, and all those things were, were common characteristics well to the recent past. And of course, you know, yeah, the sophistication of the aristocratic dwellings was remarkable, even the Heian period. Uh, fantastic material, fantastic craftsmanship, uh, most of it coming from the continent, coming from China and Korea. Uh, and this is, again, coexisting with this very, you could say, archaic, this very ancient way of living in the in the Minka. Uh, merchants in the town in, in Kyoto, in the Heian period, very tiny, tiny houses, you know, uh, all again, they have a dirt floor, and they have a little bit of a raised floor. This, again, is fairly similar, uh, and also this continued well into the recent past in, in cities. Um, yeah, takeshi also alluded to the variety and consistency I think we could say, maybe Takeshi, on your degree, in the Edo period, it sort of stabilized. There's a lot of variety, but a lot of characteristics uh, that we value uh, really are representative of, of uh, Minka from the Edo period. Uh, and these illustrations are, I just want to point out from a book by uh, Inaba and Nakayama called The Japanese Dwelling. It's a wonderful book. I recommend people who are interested uh, take a look at it. Um, there's a great, um, Museum, outdoor museum called the Nihon Minka N, which is in, in uh, um, Kawasaki, and it has about two dozen houses taken from different regions of the country and rebuilt. And again, this is, you know, what Takisan does is moves and rebuilds these things, and of course, this is again one of the special characteristics of Japanese architecture that, that it can be dismantled and moved and reconstructed. So, this is, you know, a house from Yamanashi uh, in the 17th century. Uh, this is one from Nagano in the 18th century, and you can see they're a little different. And again, yeah, these characteristics are largely based on the climate, the specific conditions, but also um, other cultural aspects, cultural sides of the lifestyle. Uh, these are the, the Dasho Zakuri in Shirakawago, and um, the upper stories were used for raising silkworms. So this is really like a little factory. 
Uh, and, um, you know, it's a heavy snow district, and actually in the wintertime, the snow could come up this high, and they, many of them had an entrance on the second floor so people could go in, uh, you know, when it was snowing. So you'd have a, an extended family living and working in a typical farmhouse. It's, we think of a family as a nuclear family, but you have to think of this as an extended family, you know, grandparents, kids, maybe cousins, aunts and uncles, maybe some uh, other workers who are not related, all living together. Uh, in this, this household, so the, the farming household. Uh, and again, uh, it's wonderful to go around the country and look at the variety of these things. It's an, just an incredible uh, diversity. Uh, we think, oh, they're all alike. On the one hand, they're all very similar, but yes, they're all uh, different and unique depending on the place and the era uh, of, you know, when they were built. Uh, and yeah, this is Katsuriki. And again, Takeshi-san pointed out one, uh, the tea house, the Japanese tea house, we should think of it as kind of an intentional sort of romanticization of uh, the most poor farmer's hut, the simplest farmer's hut. These are the people who are living the most fantastic gold leaf lacquer, you know, elaborate, you know, expensive clothes. Uh, they're the most powerful people in the country, but they want to get back to nature, get back to something simple. So uh, tea houses are kind of carefully composed to look like they're sort of, you know, randomly evolved structures dirt walls, earthen walls, you know, simple stone uh, foundations and uh, thatch, etc. But they're, they really point out to this value of, you know, trying to live uh, close, close to the environment, close to nature. Um, I want to shift a bit to talk about some of the environmental and the ecological aspects. You know, in our society, we think of these things, water, forest, you know, food, waste, energy, as sort of separate things. And people who are in university will major in something. Uh, if you're an energy specialist, you may not need to know anything about food. If you're studying forests, you may not need to know anything about waste. But in fact, these things are all connected. And this is something that Japanese people, I think, understood very, very well, even in the ancient period. Certainly in the Edo period, it allowed them to, to really make the most of their resources. And this is very much reflected in uh, the, the farm community, the farm houses, the, the farmsteads how they use the landscape, how they use, how they, how they use these resources. And of course, these things are all connected. And you could say, for instance, there's a, uh, if you call this a vector connecting water and energy, like if you make hot water, you know, well, then you have to think both about your water supply and the energy supply. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the forest and food, uh, certainly in the Jomon period, all they were doing was like eating acorns and things they could gather and animals they could kill. These like sansai that we still eat, you know, warabi, um, kinoko, that was their main diet, and of course this is still part of the diet. People very much depended on the forest uh, for food supply, and they had to maintain the health of the forest to help maintain their food supply, so they were invested in taking care of the environment. And this is really, you know, part of the underlying values of the Japanese uh, farming community. Uh, everyone, I think, knows you've been to the countryside. Uh, it's a very mountainous country, and the farms are in the valleys. And of course, these, these were originally forests, in almost every case. Uh, original mixed forests, lots of hardwood forests were cut down and turned into uh, rice fields uh, you know, over the centuries. And again, it depends on the specific area, but the farm buildings themselves generally would be pushed to the edges to sort of maximize you know, the available land for growing rice. Uh, and the lower hillsides would be used for orchards and other kinds of vegetables, etc. The surrounding mountains are called uh, Satoyama, and this is the, the mountain that you need access to for your fuel, for uh, you know supplementing your, your diet, etc. They are carefully husbanded by uh, the farming communities. Um, you know, if you look at it in section, you know, it's very mountainous. So here's like the farming valley, and here's the low hillsides where there's orchards and, and some other farming. The Satoyama is close by. And uh, the, the actual timber cutting, uh, you know, for wood, etc., tended to be in the deeper mountains, and these were sort of controlled in the Edo period, specifically, generally controlled by the government. And people were not allowed to cut trees easily. So when you look at these massive beams, etc., in the Minka, you have to think that people made a very careful decision that they're going to choose this magnificent specimen of wood, this living thing, and cut it down and. and they're sort of committed ethically to using it in a way that will allow its existence to continue uh, in a respectful, in a respectful way. And, and you see this in the, the, the quality of the craftsmanship and the way these trees, even in the mink especially, it still looks like a tree. It's really a remarkable thing. 
Uh, so, you know, they didn't take it lightly just to cut wood. It was really something very special. Uh, this is a farm set, and these illustrations are from my own book, from the Justin Elk book. But, uh, you know, this would be the farm building itself. Here's some rice fields. Uh, there's a farm yard. There's a pond always. There may be a, a kitchen garden. There's some outbuildings uh, for various kinds of work. Um, the surrounding mountains of Santo Yama would be accessible fairly closely. There's often like a bamboo forest nearby as well. And trees are carefully planted around the house uh, or the building is sited where trees help for modulating the environment to block the northern wind, to provide shade uh, in the hot summer months if necessary, and also to provide food, to provide nuts. There would be fruit trees, etc. as part of this. Um, the water uh, system for ir irrigation often would run by the house. It's sort of integrated with the pond and other things. This entire, there's a whole water system going on. Um, there's, you know, roads, of course, uh, people going in and out. So it is, you know, a, a very well integrated system. And again, this is not unique to Japan. Uh, certainly, you know, Europe, European tradition has similar things, but uh, the way it, uh, you know, evolved in Japan with an incredible variety is still remarkable. Um, typical farmhouse, um, some, many were one story, some were two. There's usually a usable attic, uh, and um, from the side, you know, there's often a, a gable that's open to allow the smoke out, uh, different treatments of the side walls, sometimes just dirt, sometimes covered with bamboo or boards. Uh, again, it really depends on the specific situation. Um, the dirt floor, this is called a doma. Again, uh, you know, began in these pit dwellings, and and they continue to be used uh, even into the, the modern period where people are still living and working in farmhouses. Some would try to replace it with concrete, but the dirt was better. It's pounded. It's mixed with lime. It's a very very hard and durable thing that can be renewed. The the hiroma, the, the the wooden floored raised area. This is the family center around the hearth, the irori. Uh, there's a kitchen a stove, this is called a kamado for other kinds of cooking, but the irori was like the fireplace, the fire pit. Um, and often in, in better off farmers' homes, there would be a zashiki, a Japanese style room with tatami mats, a kind of elegant room, which could be used for receiving important guests, like if the local samurai would come over, you would you know receive him in that room. And it's this is one of those things that sort of trickled down from the aristocrats and the, the wealthier monks who had these things in the, the earliest phase, and gradually uh, the wealthier um, uh, farmers could get them. Uh, again, this is a photograph of a building at the Mikai, and you can sort of see a doma, uh, the, the hiruma, the raised floor, and it's smoky from the smoke from the uh, Irodi hark. There's another one, totally different part of the country. This is from Tochigi, again, the doma, the, the uh, Hiroma, and in the back you can see some Zashiki. So there's a lot of similarities, uh, and they sort of evolved over time uh, to sort of converge in some ways, but maintain a lot of diversity. This is one in, in Fukushima, in Minami Aizu, again, the Doma here. And uh, this Doma is like a work area. It's really an indoor yard. Uh, and in many places, it's actually called a Niwa, as if it's a garden. Uh, and then, you know, various, uh, in, in the cold places like Aizu, you have more than one Hiroi. Uh, the beams, and again, Takshishan showed you these. Um, I remember on one of my first trips, it was my first trip to Japan, I was in Kyoto and uh, I knew a carpenter, got to know a carpenter, and he was working on uh, a, a, a kind of a farmhouse style building, and they were laying out the, the joints for some beams, for these big cross beams, and they're not straight, you know, they're crooked, they're snaky, they're curved, you know. And the way the carpenter sort of visualized how these things would intersect structurally, um, you know, it's not something that anyone who had a Western architecture education would ever be trained to do. And I don't know how they learned, but it was this very complicated uh, structural relationship they sort of visualized. And you know, when he got it right, he just made a few marks, and then they were able to make the joints. But um, it's usually like a, a, a web. It's like a structural web, the way it works out. Um, the roof structure, and again, the lower framing, etc., would, as Takeshi some pointed out, be built by carpenters. They would have professionals or people who are almost full time carpenters, but the upper stuff could be done by just about anybody, any able bodied person. So there would be poles, etc., lashed together, again, the same as in the Jomon period, uh, eventually layers of poles and then layers of bamboo, and then the thatch. Uh, thatch, there's different materials used, but one of the 
primary ones was a kind of reed called kaya, so we called this kaya uti, and then a kind of ridge protection, again, which we had even in the most ancient ones. So there's lots of structural things going on. The, the foundation would just be a stone sort of pounded in to the earth. So if you dismantled this farmhouse uh, and got rid of the stones, it was just dirt. It would immediately revert to the earth. Um, there's some very complicated joinery, which you need these experienced carpenters to do, uh, and, and not really different from the kinds of joinery you would find in a beautiful temple or a samurai or even a daimyo's house, uh, but the upper structure was just really lashed together. And again, it can be dismantled, it can be moved, it can be repaired, it can be easily expanded on, uh, modified. Uh, the walls are typically uh, what we call in English wattle and dog. It's clay walls. There'd be a, a lattice work, often of thin, thin wood or, or bamboo, and the, the clay is mixed, and there's lots of techniques for mixing this clay, which actually is allowed to ferment, uh, and uh, there's rope uh, wrapped around the, the bamboo, etc. This makes the clay adhere even better. And again, this can constantly be renewed, and even um, old uh, clay, clay from a house that's being demolished, is mixed in with the new clay when they're doing walls. It, it apparently improves its, its quality. Uh, and this uh, thatching the roof required a lot of people, part of the whole community, and there's this work called Yui, and I think Takeshita talked about this as well, mutual assistance. So year by year, they said, okay, this year we're gonna do uh, the house over there, you know, the, whatever, the Makai's house, the next year we'll do the Suzuki's house, and uh, it required the whole community, and the, the, the fields of the kaya, the thatch, would be grown and held by the community as a whole. Uh, they're maintaining this to make sure they have the supply. And there was a role for everyone. Uh, really, it was um, you know labor. Uh, there was male labor. There was female labor. There was stuff for kids to do. There was stuff for the old people to do. Um, and one of the things that and I learned that really was kind of interesting was uh, in, in many places in the thatching, there's this big needle, like maybe a bamboo or, or a long wooden pole, and it's the rope is sort of threaded through that, and then the men would be on the top jamming this thing down through the layers of thatch, and the women would be down there pulling it. And I thought that was kind of poetic in a way, something about the relationship of men and women. So it's work that I see here. It's also, yeah, it's also a ritualized enactment of social relations. Um, and again, I'm going to kind of quickly, but uh, you don't have time to read all the captions, I think, but uh, by all means, look at the book and you can sort of see all this stuff. And this is in Shirakawa. So thatching was one of those things that basically disappeared in the 20th century. Uh, for fire reasons and for cost, you know, they replaced it with these copper roofs or tin roofs you see all over the country. Uh, and it sort of died out uh, in most places, but especially I think when Shirakawa was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site, well, it became necessary to make sure there were enough people who could do this work. And I think there was a big revival of thatching technique and people come to learn and they repeatedly do this in Shirakawa and these people are, you know, basically volunteering some and some are professionals who are learning. I suppose um, as a, compared to the old days, compared to the pre-modern period where each region probably had its own subtle variations of styles of thatching, here they're sort of learning Shirakawa style and I think that may mean that as you go around the country and you see new thatched roofs, a lot of the people may have learned here. Uh, so there may be less variety in the past, but at least it's, it's being protected. Um, so just towards the end, you know, in the broader picture of uh, relationship of the environment and uh, resources, etc., the, the farm, what, what it meant to be on the farm, um, we'll look at um, what's called wara, which is rice straw. So farmers primarily are growing rice, and the straw is a byproduct, in fact. Uh, the straw, you know, they wouldn't, they're not going to eat it, they're going to eat the rice. And of course the rice has a hull, it has a, a kind of a momi, a momi wara, and they could take the hulls off, and again, they, those could be used for different things as an abrasive. Uh, they, could, uh, they could compost it, they could burn it, uh, it could be used for many things. And then, of course, the rice itself becomes brown rice, uh, genmai, and it has the nuka, the, the, the uh, germ, uh, not what's it called, anyway, the nuka on it, and that could be removed, and the nuka could be used. Um, the, the, the rice straw itself um, would be dried, and of course, they could just burn it as fuel, or they could use it for compost, but in fact, they use it to make just about everything they needed in daily life, from their shoes, their sandals, their hats, their raincoats, bags, floor mats, 
This was incredibly well used, and this was something that everybody did. Uh, they, everyone knew how to do this. People would sit around, uh, you know, in the house, especially in the winter months, and do this stuff. And of course, when it gets old, then that could be composted uh, or also burned. So this kind of approach towards, um, you know, full re full use of resources was necessary for for economic reasons and because of the lack of resources, but also it was a, a cultural value. And of course, even after it was burned, the ash had value. The ash could be sold, uh, it could be used for dyes, it could be used in metal making, it could be used for other things. So uh, it was really a remarkable example of full use. Um, I alluded to the um, Satoyama. This was a source of fuel and people, trees were important uh, and fuel was therefore precious and people were not allowed to cut trees down for fuel, generally speaking, they could only use what had fallen down naturally, and they had to carry out on their back. So this imposed a limit. So rather than our approach where, oh, if you need, you want a, more energy, you just make more energy. No, you have to limit your activity, the use of energy, to what is naturally available in an easily uh, replenishable form. Um, and this is reflected in the design of this Kamado cook stove, where it's very efficient. Uh, the, Pots are designed to seal the top so heat doesn't leak out in different sizes. And it's a very modular design, a beautiful, uh, particularly, I think, Japanese way of doing things. It's very efficient. You could burn anything and you would keep the ash, etc. Uh, things like water, uh, you know, it, it, at farmsteads, it was very typical to have a bath called a gyozui, especially in the summer months, where you'd leave a big pot of water out in the sun. It would get warm, not piping hot, but in the evening, it was warm enough to have a nice uh, scrub down. And then the water would not just be thrown away, it would make sure it would go to the farm pond, which is a source of water, non-potable water for just about everything that needs to be on the farm. Uh, water was recycled also from the kitchen. Um, this would be the, the, the uh, nagashi, the sink in the kitchen, the woman sort of crouching was very comfortable. And that gray water, we call it gray water, would also be recycled into the farm pond for other use. So that stuff is not wasted either. Uh, and I think this is the final part, is the toilet. Uh, you know, the, in the Edo period, human waste was used as fertilizer. It massively improved the production of the, the, the agriculture, uh, and it was precious. So all the toilets were designed to be easily emptied, and people were encouraged to use them. And uh, on farmhouses, you know, often there'd be just like a pot sunken into the ground, a little uh, fence around it, to encourage people to use it so they don't go pee in the bushes or something, because that uh, urine was also uh, usable for, for fertilizer. So all of this stuff, even human waste, was, was treated as a precious thing. And this is sort of the last image I have. Um, one thing that struck me was um, this interplay between rural area and the urban areas, and I think this is reflected <coughs> in the entire design and how the farmhouse is integrated with the environment and resources. If you look at these as resource flows, uh, you know, the farms send food basically to the city, vegetables, rice, etc. And this human waste is going back from the city to the farms. And they need the wood and the charcoal, that's coming from the farms down there. Lots of, you know, fish, etc., from the ocean, seafood, but also waste products from fishing used for fertilizer. Um, these are very, you know, tightly integrated flows. And the farms, you know, as we pointed out, in terms of human, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy of, of status, farmers were actually pretty high status because it was recognized that what they were doing was essential uh, for everybody. If they didn't have farms and they weren't prospering, the entire country would starve. And this was reflected in that status. Of course, economically, there was a lot of hard times and uh, the society changed. We know this lasted until basically the beginning of the major period. Many aspects continued into the 20th century, but uh, it's pretty much evaporated within recent memory. And I'm really happy that people like uh, Takeshi-san are preserving these farmhouses, because you look at them and they speak to us of all this. Uh, it's embedded in that, it's encoded in that. You can see, you can feel how much the people cared about what they were doing. And uh, you know, for me, it's a tragedy that so many are disappearing. And I know Takeshi-san is one of the leaders, really the leader, I think, in preserving the culture of Nika and then introducing it to a wider public. So anyway, that's the end of my talk. You know, this represents traditional Japan and historical preservation. And I wonder about the next generation, and is this going to be passed on to them? You had mentioned that a lot of the carpenters have now aged out and are not being replaced by their children. And it's very difficult to get those craftsmen that have that skill set. Um, you can see the age demographic of this audience, which is uh, definitely adults. 
Um, but it's not obviously in just Minka. You see it in, like, if you go to Sumo, there's very few people under the age of 50, Kabuki, etc. So what about the next generation? Where would you see this a couple of decades out? You me? Um, it, it may be it may be a little better now than it was twenty or thirty years ago. Um, just looking at my own students, people I've taught who've decided that they want to be part of this, but overall society I don't think is valuing it. And um, yeah, the carpenters are, are disappearing. And the carpenters disappear, the tool makers disappear, uh, the supplies of wood, you know, uh, good timber disappear. So to me, that's the tragedy that's evaporating in our lifetime. Uh, Takeshi-san, I mean, I'm not going to talk about how much those buildings cost, but, <laughs> you know, it's not cheap to do this stuff. You need people who are really good, who are well trained, who have a big, big experience to do it. It becomes kind of a specialist field, kind of a, I don't want to say elite, but uh, really a high grade, high class type of building. And it, that's better than not having it at all. But I don't think we'll ever go back to a time where it's the common way that people live. Um, as, as Visan said, that many uh, well trained uh, carpenters are getting old and retiring and uh, young ones they don't want to become carpenters they prefer to work for maybe big corporation banks or whatever so i am quite concerned with the next uh, uh, generation if they can continue to preserve these uh, beautiful old farmhouses uh, it's been, uh, I think the, the reason is the education. I think they haven't realized the real value of Minka. There hasn't been any education in Japanese, uh, well, elementary school, middle school, high school, university, they don't teach these things. I've had uh, uh, several groups from Europe any students of architecture as well as uh, professors or people involved already uh, in the real uh, actual work of architecture, uh, they, they told me, in, for example, in uh, Denmark, it is considered a status symbol to live in a farmhouse. And they are either successful uh, lawyer or successful doctors who can afford and they know the value and the, the, the fact that the, to live in an old farmhouse is a, is a big, uh, big, big status for, for, for them. But in Japan, it's been always a symbol of poverty. It's been dark, cold, inconvenient. So that uh, we have to uh, change this uh, idea. Otherwise, they dis keep disappearing from this country. So, education is the uh, most important thing. One other question, then we'll open up to the general audience. Um, I first came to know Takeshi Dublin. The university organized an event at the Tokyo American Center through the U.S. Embassy on cultural preservation. And in that event, you had discussed, as did the other participants, the differences between Japan and other countries in terms of preserving traditional culture. I think in England and New York City, some of these homes are established as landmarks and are protected by the government. How is Japan similar or different on those issues? Uh, I'm going to give you a very uh, striking uh, uh, figures. Uh, <clears throat> Bunkacho, the Japanese Ministry of Culture, uh, designated uh, the important uh, houses uh, throughout the nation. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 do you know the number? How many houses were designated as the important cultural, historical houses? There are 12,000, about 12,000 houses. But in England, there are 600,000. So we have way behind and and uh, I am 
I want to, I cannot uh, die, I have to work harder. <laughs> really, this is impossible. We, uh, population wise, uh, we should have uh, maybe 1,200,000 houses should be protected in this country. So that means only 1% is now, the, that's the situation and uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just add to that again, trying to be optimistic. Um, I see many local governments uh, making efforts to preserve old farmhouses, old townhouses, their architectural heritage, to share it, to find new ways to use it, to give new life to that uh, in a way that attracts younger people. And uh, you know, our colleague and friend Alex Carr is one person who's been working with local governments in different parts of the country, and of course he learned a lot from Takista as well. Um, you know, who are doing this specifically with an eye towards tourism because lots of tourists want to come and spend time in a traditional house. So this to me is a positive trend. Uh, it doesn't mean the most historic, ancient, uh, you know, structures are the ones who are going to be used in this way, but there is a movement uh, in many parts of the country uh, to try to do this as part of, you know, revitalization of rural towns which are otherwise uh, kind of dying out. Thank you very much for this very interesting speech. My name is Andre Zimmerman. Zimmerman means in English carpenter. So, Daiku in Japanese. And I feel very, very close to old buildings. I'm from Switzerland. And in Switzerland, we have a vocational training system which goes in parallel to university education. And the status is also quite high, which means it is a pride to be a carpenter or a butcher or whatever. And so I think in Japan, the biggest problem is that you don't get the right status for a very, very good work. And the education in that respect is also lacking. My question is, what is the government, or so the local governments doing to not only preserve individual buildings, but it usually is an environment which, or the setting of that house, which is just as important. In Switzerland, we have kind of a regulatory framework, which means you cannot build anything anywhere. So farms are in one place, industry in another place, housing in another one again. So actually, if you see pictures from Switzerland in, gen in general, there's, it's very harmonious in comparison to the Japanese countryside. So what are you trying to help, or how are you trying to help the local governments to understand this and do something about it? I live in I live in Kamakura, and there is an old uh, uh, library, uh, uh, and the, and the city of uh, Kamakura wanted to tear it down and uh, put up a new house, and uh, so uh, we had a charity concert and uh, raised a little money and uh, show it uh, give it to the city office, and uh, and uh, fortunately they changed their mind and uh, they decided to preserve. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, wooden uh, library. Uh, so, uh, but the, f the first stage where they made the decision to tear it down was co completely unbelievable for me, but their standard, their, their feeling is to anything that is old and inconvenient and a little not so in good condition, they won't tear it down and put up a new one. That's the that's a trend, I think, basic trend of Japanese uh, <coughs> local government uh, idea. So in the case, of, uh, I'm from Kamakura, but it's not not so easy to preserve all the beautiful historical uh, buildings. You have to it, it, it's, uh, you have to work always hard. And again, I'll just add that you know often we see it happening uh, more than when I arrived in Japan 30 years ago uh, in the name of tourism. Like I don't know if you're, people are aware that Tokyo Station came this close to being demolished, uh, but there was a sort of a public movement to preserve it. Plus, the bubble collapsed, so that one redevelopment stopped, and then it dawned on uh, Japan Rail Company that this could be very valuable. So they they did a wonderful job of uh, uh, restoring that. Um, 
I just think, oh, another thing I want to point out is there are many cases where carpentry schools have been started, uh, and in many places, and I know in Hida, I go often, you spend time in Hida, there's some good schools in Hida, for instance, and other parts of the country, so I think there's some effort to try to make that available as an option for young people who want to do it, and what's remarkable is that often there's a lot of young women who are doing this as well, so uh, you know, some of my students uh, have done that. Um, but I think the basic problem comes down to the attitude towards old houses, which fascinated me, baffled me. I'm from New Orleans, where in New Orleans, and again, like Europe and many places, if you have two houses, one's 150 years old, one is, you know, 20 years old or brand new, they're the same size, the same price, almost everybody would pick the old house. It's a nicer house, it's better, it's got character, you know, it's got a, some story to it. Uh, and that's not the case here. And, and I come down to thinking maybe it's partly superstition, you know, people think it's bad luck, you know, or of course they're dark, but Tafesha's son has shown how you can make them airy and light and comfortable, so it's not purely a technical problem, but I think it's a psychological, status-oriented, superstitious combination. Another thing about being involved in ICAST is that I actually was able to visit Tafesha Tazan's um, gorgeous minka in Kamakura this past weekend. Um, if you get a chance to go, it was amazing. Um, Actually, one thing, you've talked about the uh, kind of preservation of these houses in more rural areas where people are not as necessarily interested in doing so. And I think we also have seen a shift of people as well from these rural areas to more city um, environments over the past few decades. Um, so you see a lot of older houses with older people living in them, and then after they pass away, what happens to these houses? Do you see a connection here? And how does that kind of, this demographic shift play into what you guys are trying to do as well. Thank you. Yeah. It's definitely a, a, a huge issue, the, the biggest issue, I think. Um, and again, it's tied to the you know decline of the rural economy in general in, in many parts of most parts of Japan, uh, where younger people do leave to go to the cities, and this has been increasing oh, over the past decades. And um, you know, we can't stop that. I mean, there's aspirations. There, there, there has been the so-called U-turn movement over the past maybe. 15, 20 years where some people are choosing, more people are choosing to go back to the rural areas. But I don't know that the numbers, you know, match. Yet. I think probably more people come to come to the cities. Um, I can point to the case of Kanazawa, where my university, I retired last year, but my university was in Kanazawa, um, where when I was first started teaching there a little more than 20 years ago, um, there were a lot of empty machia, empty townhouses. And um, and a lot of old people who would die and the kids didn't want to deal with it, uh, so they just stayed there, they were decaying. And um, in the time since I was teaching there, uh, and partly through the influence of one of my colleagues, an architecture professor, um, you know, a group was started to, you know, look at and you know, celebrate these, these townhouses, these machia, and uh, then a little bit of uh, money from the local government to, to help people uh, who want to renovate them and use them. And now there's a yearly machia tour uh, of newly renovated machia in, in Kanazawa. And it's often going to be 10 in one year. Uh, there's still, I think, thousands, thousands of, of empty machia, I think, in, in Kanazawa. And I was surprised that in one case, there was a woman who was getting old, you know, she was in her 80s and she couldn't take care of her. She wanted someone to take it. She was going to sell it for like 2 million yen or something. An incredibly low price. I said, please take it and take care of it. Uh, there are people who would want to do that. Uh, and, and some of the innovative things that people have done with those much in Canada were really remarkable. Of course, shops, uh, restaurants, you know, other things. But it's really, there's a generation of, of architects and again, some of whom were my students. And I remember two years ago going and the, the chief of the Machia Appreciation Society was one of my students who's now in her early 30s. And I thought, that's great, you know, for the influence of my colleague, uh, one of the other professors who's really the most important person in that Kanazawa. His influence uh, really made the difference uh, in one generation uh, to having a whole uh, generation of designers, local people who know how to deal with it, who know the history, and who are interested in doing that. So um, it can happen locally, like many things, uh, if, if there's the right kind of local leadership and the right kind of appreciation of culture. Kanazawa is a special case, right? 
It has the tourism. It's kind of stubborn in a way, old-fashioned, you know. Uh, they know the stuff is good, but for the longest time, they just didn't have any way to deal with it. So Kanazawa is a bit special, but I think similar things can happen elsewhere. Thanks very much for an excellent reason. I have a bazillion questions, but I don't want to hog the mic, so I'll just ask one. If I wanted to renovate or renovate and move a modest sized old thing up, what, what kind of money are we talking about? That's my question too. I'm sure other people have the same question. Who else wants to ask the same question? <laughs> It is very, very, very difficult to quote, but uh, I tell you one thing. Uh, when I started uh, this uh, work, uh, it was much cheaper to build, uh, I mean, uh, much cheaper to transfer old farmhouses to new location and make a new house, new old house, than just a new house. Was, it was cheaper until 19, so until bubble economy reached its peak. And uh, after that, 1990s or so, uh, it, the situation changed. It's nowadays moving old farmhouses or renovating old houses is very, more expensive than building a new house, I'm afraid, uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, these days, houses are all designed uh, with a computer and uh, uh, produced in the factory. So it's and and uh, our way of building is handmade. It takes long time, so it's maybe two times more expensive, maybe three times more expensive than new house. But there is one advantage of uh, these old houses, they last longer than brand new houses. Brand new houses made by factories, when they are built, they are the most beautiful, uh, the time they, it's finished. But as the time goes by, it gets not so good, it deteriorates gradually, gradually. But old farmhouses, every year, looks better and better and more valuable, becomes more valuable. That's uh, my feeling. Uh, and and uh, yeah, you have architecture. To understand architecture, you have to be in that space, not the photographs, not uh, blueprints. You have to put yourself in that space. And if you do that, particularly those houses from Haksan, the mountain area, where they have a lot of snow, they use big columns and beams, and uh, somewhat I feel the house is, has, a, has a life and has this kind of a spirit. And uh, they, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. It's very difficult to explain with words. And they are durable, uh, they are simply made, they're, they're farmhouses have no decoration whatsoever. Simple, rational, practical, that's it. Durable, durability, and also natural material. But these inexpensive houses produced by factories, by thousands and thousands, they are using metal and glue. And the problem is that uh, the glue has a life limit, but the wood can last for a thousand years. And nobody knows how the glue last for how long, because they were invented or produced just recently, last uh, decade or two decades ago. We don't, they have, it's not been proven how long they last. So I, I wish you would uh, go for uh, Minka style architecture. <laughs> um, that said, uh, you can still sometimes pick up an old house, you can buy an old house frame for a million yen or or more, a million for the building, and if you want to move it, but otherwise, I think we're talking, it costs about two or three times as much as a house of the same size mm -hmm. to move it and rebuild it in a, in a good fashion, right? Yeah. Uh, but this issue of aging is really one of the most important things, and this is tied to the economy, tied to the cultural 
you know, fascination with newness, that, you know, houses here have a life of about 20 years. This is still the case, even though some manufacturers have said our houses can last 100 years, still they're being, you know, demolished and there's almost no resale value for old houses, so they're being demolished. And I think it's a great loss because after uh, 100 years or 200 years, amortized over time, the house is almost free, right? I've got a bunch of people lined up back there. Well, so. Oh, I'm uh, Ann Coates, and I've been uh, working for... Come, come a little closer to uh, the mic, please. I worked for about uh, six years as an architect, uh, rebuilding Minka and also rebuilding new Sakura houses in in, uh, in, in Ibai. Kenji Kukoko, you maybe you know Arab, Krishna house. Uh, but uh, my question is that uh, the biggest problem we have is that we have to insulate when we rebuild these houses. And that pretty much does away with the benefits of a minka. Because a minka, the Japanese house, is designed for airflow. And, and what old Japanese people did, what the, what the traditional Japanese lifestyle was, was you heated your body instead of your house. And so what my question is, is, you know, we, you know, we, we use the natural, you know, the, the pressed wood insulation, we use the, you know, the, we try to, you know, use all the natural materials, but we still have to rest build it. We still have to seal the walls, and we still have to use double pane windows and stop the airflow. So at that point, there's really not much point in the Minka style anymore. It's just an aesthetic choice. So my question is, what can we do to bring back heating the body instead of heating the house? <laughs> this is something that, this is a, this is the biggest issue that I have at an art. I, I wish you could come to see my house in Kamakura and see how cozy it is. <laughs> I use a water, uh, no, a floor heating system, yeah. a pair of glasses. Yep. Air conditioning and all that kind of things, and the glass walls everywhere. Glass. So yes, so insulation is no problem as far as I'm. Well, my yeah, it, way I mean, of... it's no problem to insulate. Yeah. But the problem is once you insulate, then you know we've got this building wrap. We don't know how long this building wrap is going to last, so we, and we think maybe it's going to last maybe 50, 60 years. But after that, it's going to fail. Then the then there's condensation, water entry. We can't see the water entry. There's mold and rot. So this is a this is the problem that I'm looking at. Is that once we wrap and insulate the building, then the lifespan is going to be severely shortened. <coughs> That's what I'm renovating yes. old houses. Is, are the building codes in your area demanding that you wrap yes. the building? Okay, yes. it's not just the client's no, no, choice. The, the building code. codes is requiring yeah, it. Yeah, so short-sighted, isn't it? But I think there must be some variance. There must be some way. Um, if well, it's a historical it's building, that they can. Historical, yeah. But, but yeah. if you want to, if you want to build a house or if you want to rebuild a minka that you can, that you're going to sell to a client, yeah, you have to meet the building code. Yeah. And the building code says you have to insulate. Yeah. And that's the problem because I've also taken apart houses that are not that old, that are 30 or 40 years old. And they've had the building wrap, and they've had the insulation, for example, the floor insulation. And when you take the floor up, you can see the mold and the rod right. that has happened because they put plywood down, and they insulated, and then they didn't, you know, maybe they didn't do the vapor barrier correctly, maybe the vapor barrier failed, but what, it, what happened is then the house isn't going to last for right. a thousand years anymore because we sealed it. Right. Um, well, you're hitting the nail on the head, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Um, this is one of the biggest issues. We know that this traditional way of building, they could last for 500 years, 1,000 years or more with you know, a certain amount of maintenance and renewal, uh, and the new building methods and materials have not been tested that long yet. Uh, but particularly the climate of Japan, most of these mold issues are moisture, uh, you know, humidity-related issues. So um, I think there's room for innovation. Someone can come up with it. Uh, I would hope that more clients don't necessarily demand uh, such a tightly wrapped building, but 
we were going to go for comfort anyway but i think there's room for innovation i just will add you know my generation i grew up in you know born in the fifty's you know as a kid in the sixty's and seventy's when in america suddenly there was a big interest in the center cities the the inner that there had been a big flight people wanted to live in these old buildings again but they didn't have insulation they were you know drafty they were uncomfortable industry found uh, solutions. They came up with things like blowing insulation and all sorts of ways to retrofit that didn't change uh, the buildings. Uh, I think this is a, a call for innovation and uh, maybe it's people like you in, in particular, maybe you should go around to some, you know, manufacturers and say, I think there's a need for this as a market, you know, let's work on it together. So I think it's an innovation issue. Just one, just one thing, uh, you mentioned the plywood. For your construction, when we take apart buildings that are forty years old, we find we typically find plywood. Uh, are you using plywood newly? In general, in general, we try not to use plywood. If we use plywood, then we use a zero KOP plywood. But but yes, some plywood. But yeah. we try not. To use yeah. The problem is that the, I used to use plywood yeah. and I gave up. Yep. This country is too humid, too humid. Mm -hmm. and the, the cause of mold very easily. And they don't last. No they don't last. So uh, I I changed my uh, from plywood uh, long ago to a solid wood. The solid wood breathe, you know. It, it, it they are still alive after 100, 200 years. Wood you cut the tree, the the wood becomes hard hardest after two hundred years of cutting. So uh, it, 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 uh, it exhale humidity, but if it's a humid, it's inhale. So whatever you do for your renovation work, better use uh, solid wood, solid board, solid uh, material. So I think. So definitely solid wood. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Let's talk more later. <laughs> Thank you both. Evening. Um, I actually don't give up on us older folks yet. I just bought a machia last week. Not, wow. not a big machia. Where? Uh, in Nishijin, Kyoto. And it's a disaster. And I just would like either of your opinions on what do you think is most important for me to think about to get that balance between tradition and modern convenience? What do you put at the top other than insulation? <laughs> I'd love to hear your opinion. Thank you. Uh, when I was young, I challenged and I changed, uh, you know, I tried to make it old house look better. I redesigned. Every time I challenged, I failed and uh, <laughs> I regretted. So one thing I, I discovered is that if you see a space that is beautiful and originally designed, originally built by carpenters, Respect it and don't change it. There's a space, there are rooms that you can change, but also there are rooms you should never change. So you have to make your own decision by yourself, by bringing yourself in, in, in that space. Thank you. I'll stay seated, but um, I would say most of the really successful Minka renovations I've seen that felt comfortable. Uh, one reason was because the, the kitchen and bath and toilet, those areas had been carefully worked out and were, were modern. Uh, so I think that's one place to definitely think about, and I think takeshi -san does that regularly. Um, and others, uh, gee, you know, if it was me, see, I'm not like everybody. I would live in it in, in as probably very close to its original form. I like living on the floor. I, I don't mind sitting next to a little heater, you know? Uh, I'm different from most people, so it's, it's hard to say, but uh, I've been to quite a few nicely renovated uh, minka or machia, um, where, you know, some of the materials were replaced, the structural issues were taken care of. Yes, maybe the glass or double paned uh, windows now, uh, but basically the, the configuration of the space, the flow of the space, the relationship between the earthen floor doma and the raised floor, this is all maintained, uh, you know, very, very well. Uh, but I think uh, a lot will depend if you're comfortable sleeping on a futon or you want to have a bed. Do you want to, you know, sit on the floor to eat or do you need to have a dining table? I mean, all these issues, People have to work out uh, individually. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, my husband and I have a place in Nagano Prefecture along the Tenryu River. It used to be a tiny um, castle, and people in the town are absolutely uninterested. They have no interest. They said that, well, there are two other places that are sort of like it with the same kind of mon with the kura and kura on the side, sort of like in Karashki area. He said, there are already two of them. Oh, you don't have to keep the third one. Uh, and in uh, Nagano, it's a small town, um, and you don't get any financial help. You don't get any moral support to be able to, be able to, to uh, preserve it. If it's a big city like Kyoto or Kanazawa, yeah, it's very, very different. Um, and I can say this, there are some young Japanese people who are returning to the countryside, and they are looking for old Japanese uh, munka and they themselves are repairing them, and they want to have a guest house. Uh, they want to bring up their children in nature. Uh, so that's very encouraging. And also there, um, I also like to mention, uh, Mr. Bondo and Mr. Suma, do you know them? They were architects in America, Japanese people, studying a lot in America, and they have come back to Japan. They want to save the Japanese uh, houses now. So they take an old minka, or like the one architect took his old uh, uh, ancestor's house and made it into a share house, but kept all of the quality of an old Japanese house. Also, um, they sometimes take it, they don't pick up a building, take it apart and move it. They see where it is and try to preserve it by making it usable. Uh, maybe old people leave and young people don't want to live there, but. They make them into offices uh, for people to go there every day and to take care of the building in general. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention that. And his, their office is in uh, Ikenure, along the Inokashiro line. So if people want some help, perhaps they'd be able to help. Uh, they seem to be overwhelmed a little bit. Um, but what I would really like to know is, do you have any suggestions of how to get funding um, to be able to preserve uh, what we do have in a very small town in Nagano Prefecture. Uh, Mr. Bondo said that uh, companies sometimes will repair it and then uh, you can rent it out to somebody and slowly pay the company back. I've heard that. Um, Foul funding, uh, but anything that any place from which we can get money yeah. to preserve it, because it's really on the brink. If we don't take care of it now, it's going to be really in sad shape. I can't think of any example where it wasn't a local government program. And again, right. Kanazawa is a great example. Not uh, they provided is some, very poor. Some, some funding for that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of, of any any funds, so maybe yeah. an interesting business angle is your best, your best option. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, is it it's shikui plaster? Is the walls plaster? Oh, yes. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the clay and the what? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's an old kura, like a right. hundred and some years old and very beautiful. And there's also another kura farther inside and mm -hmm. also ishigaki. Uh, Sounds walls. great. So you literally, you actually bought a castle? No, we <laughs> inherited it. <laughs> <laughs> you inherited yeah, it? Yeah. Tell me about your family. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's, but the town has mm. been terrible and has yeah. not helped us to get ideas. They, you know, even before we would fix it, they, we'd have to have the ground all dug up for, uh, you know, remains uh, oh, yeah. from long right. ago, and we have to pay for it. Yes, uh, to have everything mm. dug up because that town at, uh, used to be during the um, Kamakura period, a Chinsa something, Chinsa, mm. uh, a place for you know monitoring where people were coming and going in Japan, and also during mm. Heian period, it was a uh, Michi no Eki. Mm. Um, and we just, I mean, it's going to be overwhelmingly expensive. And we just really would like to know, does anybody have money? <laughs> 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 or any uh, what, what, I, it's very difficult to, it, it is very difficult to depend on the uh, local government. Uh, yeah, so please don't waste your time. <laughs> and But I suggest that uh, you should uh, maybe make a small group of uh, uh, 
townspeople or villagers and uh, you know get together and have a maybe fundraising concert or something. And uh, the music is always a good uh, good way to invite people in this kura or display beautiful paintings or photographs. And the best thing to to to, to have a help is to have your neighborhood uh, get involved. They actually are hoping it goes away. Yes. Yeah. That's really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Takushita and Asmi, this was just really terrific. Thank Great you. content. Very interesting. Thank you.